title of the series is Healing, and today I want to talk about releasing power. Uh, could you please say that? Say that out loud. Say releasing power. Yeah, say this, say this. I've got some power, but I need to learn how to release it. Say that. I've got some power, but I need to learn how to release that. And so I'm going to start by referencing Acts chapter 3. You can go there if you want. I'm not going to read uh, the entire 10 verses. I'm just going to summarize it for you. But in Acts chapter 3, the first 10 verses, this is after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And they were changed. Their world was just flipped upside down for, for the good. And so Peter and John are now full of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that they're on their way to the temple to pray. <clears throat> and while they're going to the temple, there's a crippled man there. And they see that he needs a touch from the Lord. Uh, and Peter sensed in his heart that, 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 that this guy had faith to be healed. He said, look at me. And you remember uh, the, the incident. Uh, the Bible says uh, that Peter looked at him and said, hey, silver I do not have and, and gold I do not have. But what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And an instant miracle takes place. This man is healed. If you were paralyzed and, and you were healed, I have a feeling you would be dancing and praising God. And so everyone is, is rejoicing. Now, what the people that saw the miracle, they tended to look to Peter and John. And so Peter responds quickly, he says, hey, don't look at us as if by some uh, that is by our power uh, that we healed him. But it, it was by the power of Christ. He immediately gave glory to the Lord and, and recognized that, that it was the Lord. Uh, because of that great miracle, the, the, the ruling elders, the Sanhedrin called in uh, Peter and John. Uh, they were troubled by that miracle. You remember, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they were in competition with Christ. They, they, uh, cr Jesus was crucified. And so they were troubled by this miracle. They bring him in. And the verse that I want to read to you as we begin today is Acts chapter 4, 13. So think about this incredible miracle that took place. Now they're in front of the ruling elders who are troubled by this. They're telling them, look, it's just by the power of Christ. But here's what the Bible says. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Acts 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great verse? Amen. They had been with Jesus. So I'm here to share with you today. It's not about how much education you have. It's really not about what you know in the natural, they had been with Jesus. That makes all the difference in the world. They had spent some time with Jesus. They had learned his heart. They had learned his ways. They had learned how to walk like him, how to, how to talk like him. They, they had seen Jesus do incredible miracles. And so they were, they were unschooled. They were ordinary. Someone say, that's me. Come on, say that. So, you're, so we're all qualified here today. We're all ordinary. But every one of us are qualified to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And so today I want to talk about how to release the power that God has given you. Uh, notice what Peter said. He said, silver and gold. I, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of education. But what I have, let me give it to you. Uh, see, you have incredible potential on the inside of you, but you have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have resurrection life on the inside of you. You have healing fire, healing power on the inside of you. The question is, how do you, how do you release that into a broken, into a hurting, into a dying world? How, how do you release that power? And very specifically, in this case, how do we see healing released? And so uh, understand, first you've got to realize, just like Peter, you, you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You may not have a lot of money today, but you could have all the money in the world and be sick as a dog, right? You could be, uh, j sorry, that was a little, was that, that's a little, a little bit of the vernacular there. So you could have all the money in the world, and, but, but be very sick or have, have an incurable disease. That money isn't going to do anything for you. But I've got great news for you. You've got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, resurrection life 
on the inside of you, incredible power. But how do you release that? And so I want to share some nuggets with you today, some, uh, some things uh, that will help you to release uh, that power. So these men had been with Jesus. So the very first thing that I'm going to encourage you to do is spend some time with Jesus. You've got to spend time with the Lord. Now, now I'm looking around the, the room, and to my knowledge, uh, what I can see is everyone here is, is born again. I'm, I, I don't know if you're all living for the Lord. I hope you're living for the Lord. But if we, we're all born again, we, you, you've received Jesus as your Savior. Uh, but the question is, do you really know him? Now, now we can all know him more. Uh, see, that's the thing about a relationship with God. It's inexhaustible. There's always more. And once you get touched by the Lord, you, you want to know him more. Uh, and, and so we need to spend some time with Jesus. Listen to Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read to you, uh, starting with verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Okay, so as you get to know the Lord by his spirit, he's going to give you wisdom and he's going to give you greater revelation. Watch this, so that you may know him better. Okay, now, if you know the Lord, say, I know him. Now say it as a prayer, Lord, I want to know you better. I want to know you. Uh, so, so, so that you may know him better. Uh, and then he says this, I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, now notice that it's the eyes of your heart. You get to know the Lord through your heart. Uh, yes, you increase knowledge. Yes, you study the, the word. But it's really your heart. It's your heart. You get to know him. This is a love relationship. Uh, and so you get to know the Lord. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, isn't that your heart that you say, Lord, I, I want to know you better. I want the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I would like a greater revelation of, of who you really are, uh, of what you've accomplished, that you are far above all sickness. You are far above all emotional trauma. You are far above this mess that I might live in. He is far above. Lord, let the light of the Lord shine on me. Let the eyes of my heart begin to see the riches of my inheritance. I'm here to tell you today that you have an inheritance and, and it's called healing. Uh, you have an inheritance, it's called wholeness. Uh, the Lord desires that and wants that for you today. Wants you to realize that that's the glorious riches of your inheritance, but it's the eyes of your heart that need to be enlightened. So, so we need to, to know him better. My brother and my sister, all it takes is spending some time with Jesus. And so the Bible tells us that often Jesus withdrew to lonely places to pray, to spend time with, with his father. Okay? And so it's cultivating a relationship with the Lord. Why, why do we want to spend time with the Lord? We want to spend time because we love him, but we need to know his heart. How do you get to know his heart? You, you get to know his heart by, by spending time with him. If you really know someone, you, you know their heart. If you really know your spouse, you, you know their, their heart. You know what they would say in a situation. You know how they would respond uh, in a situation. So, so you want to know his heart. You want to know his ways. Um, you want to know his voice. So I'm looking at my wife now. I know the sound of her voice. We could be in a crowd of people. We could be, there could be thousands of people. But if she calls my name, I know her voice because I've spent a lot of time with her. I also know her heart and I know her ways. If you went to Walmart and then you came to me and said, you know what, I saw Pastor Sarah in Walmart and she was just cussing out uh, the, the cashier. In fact, she grabbed a baseball bat and started, and started breaking up things at Walmart. I would say you got the wrong person because I know her heart and I know her ways. Uh, 
Now, I'm exaggerating there, but, but when you get to know God's heart and his ways, you know how he would respond to a situation. You know. Uh, so, so they knew. G- Peter and John had spent time with Jesus. They were unschooled. They were ordinary men, but they had spent a lot of time with Jesus. And so they knew. They knew how he would respond. See, as life gets more and more complicated and as evil rushes in on us here in the end times, my brother and sister, you've got to know the heart of the Lord. And you're going to have to know what's truth. And you're going to have to know, and you're going to have to say, yep, Jesus is not for that. Or Jesus is for that. Because many things in our culture, if you haven't figured it out, we're in the middle of a cultural war right now. And so you have to discern and say, what is the heart of Christ in that particular situation? And so when it comes to healing, what is the heart of the Lord? God's heart is that he loves you and he wants to heal you. And we've been talking about that. So we need to spend time with Jesus. If, if you want to flow in healing, if you want to release the power of God, spend time with the Lord so that you know his heart, you know his ways, and you know his voice. Amen, church? The second thing is this. Learn who you are and what you have in Christ. Learn who you are and learn what you have in Christ. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1 and verses 20. To 22. 1 Corinthians 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. And verses 20 to 22. Now watch this. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Please say that out loud. Say yes in Christ. For no matter how many promises he made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us and set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, put these verses together. There are many, many promises. They are yes in Christ. So Jesus has fulfilled those promises. And because you have a relationship with Christ, you've received Christ, they are yes in Christ. Now we speak the amen. The promise is given in the word of God, fulfilled in Christ. I say amen to that. By his stripes I am healed. By his wounds I am healed. That is the promise. Fulfilled in Christ, I say amen to that. Now, now there's a deposit that is in me, the Holy Spirit, that guarantees what is to come. Okay, So it guarantees. So the Holy Spirit is on the inside of me. I'm saying amen. The Holy Spirit guarantees it. I say amen. It comes to pass in my life. Let me try to articulate that. The promise of the Bible, all of the healing is available to me. It's fulfilled in Christ. I say amen, the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing that that promise is coming to me. Watch this, my word is what brings that connection into play. So I say amen, my agreement, when I say amen, I'm not just a parrot saying the word, I'm not just saying it, uh, just to say it, I own the information, I say amen to the promise, the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing that, but I'm the one that brings it together with my agreement and with the words that I speak. So I say amen to the promise. I say yes, Lord, I receive. That is the promise that you have for me. So I learn who I am and what I have in Christ. So you need, if you want to release the power of God in your life, learn who you are as a child of God. Learn who you are as a minister of the gospel. Learn who you are and what God has given you, and you speak it into being. You say amen. You say yes to it. All of those promises are available to you. Amen? So it's a matter of learning. Now, you spend time with Jesus, and you read his word. You're going to learn who you are in Christ. In fact, that would be a good study. Find all of the in Christ passages. And you'll find out you've got peace in Christ. You'll you'll find out you've got joy in Christ. You'll discover you've got some forgiveness in Christ. You'll find out you've got healing in Christ. You've got deliverance in Christ. You've got provision in Christ. 
Study all the passages and you'll find out what you have in Christ. Can you say amen? So find out who you are, what you have, and then you'll begin to release that. Most Christians don't really understand what they have. We don't really uh, fully comprehend what God has given us. If we understood that and who we were, we would release that a little more. Amen? I don't know about you, but I'm praying for greater revelation that I would know the Lord and I would discover who I am and discover what is available to me. Amen, church? Someone say releasing the power, releasing the power. So spend time with Jesus. Get to know his heart. Get to know his ways. Get to know his voice. Learn who you are and what you have in Christ. Uh, the third thing is this, and I, I've touched on it and given you some examples, uh, but use symbolism. Symbolism is a powerful way to, to release faith. Now, we always have to be careful when we talk about symbolism and we have to explain it because people could begin to get their eyes on the symbol instead of Christ. Uh, there are whole segments of Christianity where they put way too much emphasis on a symbol. Okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not picking on the Catholics, but maybe I am. Uh, but when you, when you go into a Catholic church, you always see Jesus on the cross. Okay? I, I've got news for you. He's not on the cross anymore. I'm thankful that he was on the cross. But that symbol, that, the symbol of the cross can release faith and be a reminder to you, but it should not become a religious thing where you put your faith in that symbol instead of the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, so we always have to, have to realize that and understand that our faith is in the Lord. But symbolism does activate faith in our life. So look at, look at James uh, chapter 2. James 2 and verse 17. And this is talking about Abram. Uh, and he, it says this, faith in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So, so faith, if it's accompanied by action, uh, then, it's, then it's alive. Uh, but if I don't have action to my faith, then it's just dormant potential. It's dead. And, and so what symbolism does is it activates your faith. Now, we've given some examples of that where somebody uh, is anointed with oil. Uh, we know there's no power in the oil in and of itself. But we understand what it represents, and because it represents the Mashiach, the presence of the Lord, the presence of Yahweh, uh, Jesus was the anointed one. So when we smear oil on us, it activates something in us. We know there's no power in the oil, but it activates something in us. And I've just found in the ministry process, when I'm praying for people, when I'm ministering, that using symbols or pictures that God might give me when I'm praying for someone, it activates faith. If you get a vision or a picture for someone and you're praying for them uh, for inner healing, uh, that will activate the faith that, that is in their heart. So use symbolism uh, to release the power. Let me give you a couple of examples. In John chapter 20 and verses 21, before Jesus goes to the Father, he's, he, he's been resurrected and he meets with the disciples. And the Bible says this, uh, they're astonished to see him, uh, but then he prays for them. And he says this, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And then the Bible says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they'll draw that up on your video screen. Jesus is with his disciples, and he breathed on them. <sighs> Just breathed on them. Now, that might be an unusual way to pray for people, and you may not be used to that. But when you think about why he would breathe, and when you think about the scriptural references and the journey throughout the scriptures, it makes a lot of sense. Let me give you an example. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament is the word ruah, and it means breath of God. And so, so when God created the world, he, he breathed by, by the power of, Holy, uh, of the Holy Spirit. He breathed. So ruah is breath of God. So when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathes on them, He's breathing the breath of God, the, the ruah of the Lord. Uh, same Holy Spirit that was hovering over the darkness and hovering over the waters. And then God spoke the world into being. The Holy Spirit is hovering over you. God breathes on you. And when he breathes, he releases life. He took Adam, who was uh, 
just made out of the clay. The Bible says that God breathed into him and gave him life. So when the Holy Spirit, when Jesus breathes on, the, on his disciples, he's releasing life. He's releasing the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so I've found that when I'm praying for people and I breathe on them, it releases. There's something that it activates faith in them because they feel the wind. Uh, I, my faith is activated as I breathe on them because I think about the Holy Spirit being released from the inside of me and on to them. There's something in the natural uh, about breathing because it, uh, of what it represents. Now, when you're praying for people, you do want to have good breath. Because there's nothing more distracting than when somebody's breathing on you to release the power of the Holy Spirit and they have terrible breath. And you're thinking there's nothing spiritual about that. But you understand what I'm saying? So, so whether you're anointing someone with oil, whether you're laying hands on them, whether you're breathing on them, you're releasing. Now, I've, I've found that when I breathe over somebody that power is released right out of my spirit. It's not just breathing, but life, resurrection life is coming out of me and in to them, activates something in them, activates me. What is happening is the supernatural is being connected to the natural. Okay, So Jesus breathed on his disciples. Um, another example is out of Luke chapter 14, where Jesus prayed for this man who had dropsy. Dropsy is is an old term for like inflammation or swelling. He might have even had like elephantitis where he was just really, really, really swollen. And so Jesus takes a hold of the man. Now, now the, the NIV here and even the English doesn't really give us justice. I think the NASB uses the word seize, which would be a little more accurate. It says in verse 4, but they remain silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Now, that doesn't seem like anything when you read that in the English. He just took a hold of the man. Did he just hold him? Did, did he hug him a little bit? Uh, the word seize is actually, is actually a better rendition. What it means is he grabbed that guy. He just grabbed him. Now, I don't know if he was swollen. Let's say he had elephantitis. Let's say he felt rejection. Let's say he felt like he was pushed away from society. I can just see Jesus saying, you know what? I'm going to show this guy that I love him. You come here. And he just grabs this guy full of love and says, I love you. And he grabs him. And it's not just, it's not just holding him. He, the, this word right here in the Greek, he's hugging him tight. He is grabbing a hold of him. And when he grabs a hold of him, he's releasing what's inside of him into that person. And I, I have seen that again and again. I've seen where I breathe on someone and they get healed. But I've also seen when I hug somebody and I release the love of the Lord. And it's, it's not just saying, hey, I love you. It's not just saying, hey, Jesus loves you. But resurrection life on the inside of me is coming right out of me and into the mm, be healed. Hallelujah. Mm, receive the love of the Lord. And I've seen that oftentimes with, with, with guys, with men. Men that are just hurting and broken. And what they need is a father in the Lord to just come and hug them. What they need is a brother in the Lord to just come and say, you come and I just grab them and I release the love of the Lord and right out of my spirit and into their bodies, they get healed. Can you say amen, church? Uh, and so just a couple of more examples of, uh, of symbolism. We've talked about other ones in, in, in other teaching. But I've just found that in releasing the power, if you want to minister to people, spend time with the Lord, get to know his heart and his ways, learn who you are and what you have in Christ, and then use symbolism as, as you're praying for people, as you're ministering to people. That, that could be a picture that God gives you for them. It could be a vision, but it could be the physicality of even something like breathing or, or, or taking hold of someone. And so, you know, so I, I breathe on people when I pray for them. Now, that may have changed everything. You might have been looking for and excited about the healing service. And now that you know that I, I breathe on people, maybe we won't have anyone show up on, on that Sunday. But if you're not comfortable with that, that is okay. You can re receive, your, or just when you see me come and move away. But I will have plenty of breath mints. And so 
I, I breathe on people, but, but I also I release the resurrection life that is inside of me. Now, let me, let me explain this to you a little bit. Think about this. If, you, if you've ever thrown a ball, whether it's a baseball or, or any kind of ball, when, when you have a ball in your hand and you, you throw that, notice that it, it's released out of your hand. Okay? You had something in you. You had something you were holding on to. You could feel the weight of it. And when you throw it, that weight is lifted. And the energy and the inertia of that, that ball is released. It, it's actually the same thing when you pray for people. Okay? We don't always sense that, but, but when you're praying, when, when you're laying hands, we talked about transference of power. When you lay hands, power's coming out of you and in, into that person. Uh, you're releasing the energy, the resurrection, the life of the Lord coming from your spirit. You're God's conduit. He's got to use people here on earth. He releases it into that, that person. And so I found that, that when I release the fire of the Lord, the presence, the power of the Lord from me into somebody else, it's like I can feel that power leaving me and into that person. And so that's why I, and the only way I can think of is what the Lord told me, that's why I shoot the power into people. I release it from me into them. Okay? Now, many of you heard me share this, but I'll share it again. The, this all started when I was a youth pastor, and the Lord told me to shoot the power into the kids. Just shoot it. And I said, Lord, you mean like, said, yeah. So I said, okay, I'll try it. So, and a youth group is a great place to practice. <laughs> so I lined up all the kids in a row, and I said, I, and I declared, I said, I'm going to shoot the power into you guys. You're going to feel the power of the Lord. So I started on one end, and I, I, just, started, I just started practice, <laughs> like I was throwing something. Just, <laughs> let me release it from here. Into the, <laughs> and you got to do the sound effect. Because the sound effects will build your faith, activate your faith, just like other things. So I said, oh, I'm going to do the sound effects. So, well, that wasn't working. So I thought, so I'm trying different things. And nothing in the natural is happening. So I'm shooting it, but nothing is happening. And I get near the end, and there's this kid, and he had just been in an accident, and he had broken his ribs. And so I shot the power in him, and his whole body started to shake. And his whole side was just trembling like that. And all of the kids just went crazy. Look at that. They started running over. Look at that. He's shaking. It's moving. It's moving. It's moving. And that kid had come to church just in terrible pain as he was shaking under the power of God. God must have healed those ribs because all of that pain left his body. And I went home and I thought, it works. It works. Hallelujah. And to this point, sometime later, must have been a year or so later, I thought, well, we were in the Philippines and I was ministering and I just had that image of, of throwing things. So the spirit of God was moving in this congregation. People were just getting blasted by the Lord. So I just I had this visual. I said, well, I'm just going to throw hand grenades. That's what I'm going to do because people were falling out in the power of the spirit. And so. So that's what I started to do, and I, I would I would say, hey, and I'd call somebody out, and I'd, sometimes I'd give them a word, and I said, I'm gonna now I'm gonna throw the hand grenade of the Lord. See, I don't have a scripture for that one, but <laughs> I'm gonna throw the the fire of the Lord. I'm gonna throw the presence of the Lord. So I I, I would just throw, and I went like this, and I would feel that throw it, and it wasn't, it, but it was something in the spirit, and the power of the Lord would hit him, boom, and they'd hit the deck and hit the ground. And, and they, people were getting healed and touched. And, and I thought, well, that's how you release the power. But I hope I'm giving you some visuals on, on how you release what's inside of you. Now, you've got to do what works for you. Now, my wife's personality is very different than mine. I have not seen her throw any hand grenades. <laughs> I have not seen her do the... Now, I've grabbed and hugged. I have not seen her <laughs> grab people. But she is not as demonstrative as I am. You may, you may not have the same personality. But you understand what I'm saying? I I'm hope I'm giving you visuals. How do you release what, what's inside of you? You know, and so that's why, you know, when the Lord, uh, you know, had me start taking my hand like a sword and, and cutting things off of people, you know, that, that's a visual, that, that's, a, uh, that's a symbol, okay? So there's a lot of scriptures about the sword of the Lord, and, and I've, I've shared with you before how the enemy will attack us, and he will attack us from behind, 
And so he'll, he'll put claws in our back and generational curses and things. And so when I'm praying for people, I'll often just say, you know what, I'm going to take my hand like a sword now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut off. But just that visual activates something in me and just that visual activates something in them. Okay? Now, I'll give you an example. When I was in Kenya years ago, while I, I just finished preaching, I'm calling out words of knowledge and, and ministering, and here came this woman who was completely demonized. And she's screaming and shouting and pointing at me. And so I'm just trying to call out words of knowledge of healing, but she's coming. And so I said, well, I'm going to release the power on her. And so I walked over while I'm calling out words of knowledge, and I just took my hand like a sword and just cut everything off from her, just ran the sword right down her back. And so she hit the deck, and she's just trembling and shaking on the ground. Uh, now, at that point in time, I'm just calling out words of knowledge, and she's going through a deliverance. And so uh, people started getting very curious about that. They're looking, you know, what's going on. And so ultimately, I had them take her out of her room, but that w- out to, into a different room. But that woman was completely healed and set free. Why? Because of the sword of the Lord. Jesus did the healing, but that was just a symbol. Okay? But we're talking about releasing what's inside of us. So, so use symbolism. Uh, The next thing is this. I would encourage you to be bold about things. Be bold. Again, you're learning who you are in Christ. You're learning what you have. So be bold about it. Listen to Acts chapter 14 and verse 3. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. So they were bold. They spoke for the Lord, and then he confirmed the message of grace by signs and wonders. And so I would encourage you, be bold in your declaration. God loves you. Jesus wants to heal you. Let's pray for a miracle. Just be bold and declare it. I've discovered that when we are bold and we speak what Jesus speaks, you might be afraid of it in the natural, but speak it. Hey, I told you before, he's going to back you up. And the fruit is always out on the limb of a tree. When I was a kid in Africa, it always seemed like the best mangoes were in the highest branches on the branch that was far away, and you had to climb out there. You had to get another stick to try to try to not. But the fruit is out on the limb. Okay. And I like what my father-in-law used to say. He said, but most Christians are tree huggers. They'll just hug around what's safe. Listen, if you want to see God do something, you've got you, you, you to be bold and go for it. And people say to me and say, well, why? you see miracles, you see healing. Yeah, but I, I'll pray. I, I'll pray for anybody and anything. I'll pray for a dog if it'll sit there long enough for me to, to pray for. Uh, but you just got to be bold and go for it. Amen? And, and I found out this. Let me tell you this. Most people will, will not refuse prayer. If you say to someone, hey, can I pray for you? Uh, if you stop someone in the store in a restaurant who you know, has a back brace and say, oh, what happened to you? Can I? Can I pray for you? They're not going to turn you down. Most people are going to say, yeah, I'll welcome that. Unless they have a a wall that's up against religion or up against Christianity. But what have you got to lose? Amen? What have you got to lose? You're trying to get answers uh, to people. So be bold. The the next thing is this. you got to practice. Say that. I'm going to practice. Okay? So listen to to Matthew chapter 7. Listen to Matthew chapter 7. And verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everyone say practice, okay? So, it, it, and, and when, uh, the way I want to teach this is when you put it into practice, you, you do it, that's what he meant there, but what I want to say is you practice doing it, okay? So, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who build his house on the rock. So you want to build your house on the rock. If you build it on the sand when the storms come, uh, it's going to deteriorate. It's going to fall apart. When you build on the rock, no matter what storm comes. But here we practice things. So in other words, you practice, you're working on things, like you're working on a house. You you practice. Uh, You practice uh, like a doctor. Uh, you You don't know all the answers, but your job and my job is simply to pray for people. My job is to simply point them to Christ and point them to the healer 
So, so we keep practicing things. You know, that, that may sound funny and unusual about shooting the power and, and things, but what was I doing? I'm practicing. I was practicing on all these kids until I saw the power of the Lord release and they got touched by the Lord. Amen, church? So practice. I, I can't encourage you enough to, to practice serving the Lord with your gifts. Practice praying. Practice doing things. Even if you make mistakes, just keep practicing. Now, we've said this before, but even doctors are just practice on on you. They don't know all the answers. They say, here, try this pill. That didn't work here. Come back here. Now you try this. Now th they're just practicing. They don't have it all together, and they're really bold about it. They put it on their sign, family practice. Okay, And so you can just say that when you're praying for, hey, I'm just going to practice on you a little bit. Now I'm going to have some visions and dreams. I'm just practicing, trying to figure this out. I may, be, I may be wrong. You might as well take the road of humility because if you think that you got it all together, you're going to find yourself in trouble anyway. Okay, so, but practicing. So, so say this out loud. Say, I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to practice. Okay, now pinch your neighbor and say, hey, I might start practicing on you, man. I might, okay. <clears throat> And the last one that I just want to share with you today is, is stand in faith. you got to stand in faith. So 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, I love this verse. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Well, we might as well read verse 14, do everything in love. But stand in faith. So pray, believe God, and then just leave the results up to the Lord. Okay? So that is your job. Okay? I, I don't want to hurt your feelings today, but you're not the Savior. Right. Jesus is the Savior. Okay? I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're not the healer. Okay? Jesus is the healer. Okay? Now, we all chuckle about that, but here's what we do. We put a lot of responsibility on ourselves, and, and, and we're very concerned about ourselves. And if you're really honest, you're concerned about what other people will think about you, too. Well, what if I pray and they don't get healed? What if they're going to? That's not your job. Your job is to pray, God will heal. Just like your job was to pray for him, lead him in a prayer for, uh, of salvation, but Jesus is a Savior, amen? And so we've said this before, but it's just worth repeating. Listen, if somebody gets healed, you can't take the credit for it, can you? But by the same token, if they're not healed, you can't blame yourself. Because Jesus is the healer. He decides when and how he heals someone. So what do you do? You, you pray for someone, but you stand in faith. And you say, I, I, you know what? I prayed for you. We're going to stand in faith, and we're going to leave the results up to God. Amen? So don't allow trying to figure it all out to keep you from practicing and trying and doing something. Okay? I shared with you before, you always have to have what I call the category of the unexplained. There are many things that I cannot explain in my life. But I've said, you know what, God, I am going to continue to do what you've called me to do and obey you and leave the results up to you. Amen, church? So just, just some nuggets today, six nuggets. Spend time with Jesus. Learn who you are and what you have in Christ. Use symbolism. Be bold. Practice and stand in faith. Listen to this scripture in closing, Acts 28, verse 8, talking about Paul. His father was sick in bed. Suffering from fever and dysentery, Paul went in to see him, watch this, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. He placed his hands on him and he healed him. Listen, stand in faith, believe God, because he wants to use you as well. Amen? So let, let's say this in closing. Say this, I have God's power. Say it. And his power will flow through me. Okay? Hold your hands out in front of you. Say, these are healing hands. I can pray for the sick. Okay? Okay? So God's power is going to flow through you. He can flow through every single one of us. We want to receive, but we also want to be the conduit of God's healing power. Amen, church? Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet.